This is Better Edge, a Northwestern medicine podcast for physicians. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner, Associate Professor of Neurology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center and Division Director of Neurology at Regional One Health in Memphis, Tennessee. Today, we are discussing the neurologic complications of COVID-19 and the strange phenomenon of long COVID. We have three expert guests today, Drs. Eric Liotta, Edith Graham, and Igor Koralnik. Dr. Liotta is Associate Professor of Neurology and Surgery. Dr. Graham is Assistant Professor of Neurology and a Specialist in Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroimmunology. And Dr. Koralnik is the Archibald Church Professor of Neurology and Chief of Neuroinfectious Disease and Global Neurology. All of the faculty work at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern Medicine. Welcome, Drs. Liotta, Graham, and Koralnik. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, to start, as neurologists, we are particularly interested in how this COVID virus affects the central and peripheral nervous system, as well as the relatively new phenomenon of long COVID. Dr. Koralnik, as a neuroinfectious disease specialist, what do we need to know about COVID and its neurologic complications? Well, this is an excellent question. This is why we wrote uh, this paper that we're discussing today. We are are seeing two very distinct population of patients uh, here at Northwestern Medicine affected with COVID-19. The first population of patients is severely sick, hospitalized with COVID pneumonia, and we uh, sometimes they are intubated in our ICU. And we have seen that approximately 82% of those will have some neurologic manifestation uh, during the acute phase. In addition, we have a second very distinct population of patients who had only a mild respiratory presentation of COVID-19, sore throat, cough, a little bit of fever that went away, but then thereafter uh, are presenting with these lingering symptoms called the long COVID syndrome, and we are seeing them in our clinic. And this is why we wrote this neurotherapeutics paper on how to care for both population of patients. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. And it's very interesting that there are these two groups of patients. Now, as a neurologist, one question that I have, you mentioned 82% of the sickest patients in the hospital have some complication, some neurologic complication from COVID. So how, do you know, what percentage of those is due to the the virus itself or is it just because they're sick and intubated and you know bad things are happening you know what what does the virus do well some of those complications like difficulties with sense of smell or taste may be more directly related to the virus and a number of those complications could be more of an effect of what the virus is doing systemically with the inflammation or problems with clotting throughout the body. In particular, probably the most important complication in the hospitalized patients is something that's called encephalopathy or this global brain dysfunction that can range from confusion all the way up to coma. And it looks like uh, encephalopathy is more uh, likely due to the effects of the virus on the body causing inflammation or problems with blood clotting or dysfunction of the blood vessels themselves and not so much a direct invasion of the virus into the brain. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Liotta. What about stroke? That's another big problem. Yeah, so stroke is uh, reported in about 1% to 3% of the hospitalized patients, and it does seem like it's more uh, frequent in the the critically ill, so it's about 6% of those patients. Uh, It seems like the... uh, most common mechanisms of stroke in the patients with COVID encephalopathy are either what we call cryptogenic, so it's not really clear what the mechanism is, or cardioembolic. And we know that uh, as a complication of COVID-19, people can have abnormal heart rhythms or they can have dysfunction, other dysfunctions of the heart like heart failure. And it also looks like something about COVID-19 causes a predisposition to clotting. So these patients have a tendency to form clots. And it also looks like there may be a dysfunction at the actual lining of the blood vessels themselves that can lead to, um, lead to stroke. 
The strokes that we see in people with COVID-19 can range anywhere from very punctate infarcts that we find incidentally on imaging when we're working up another um, syndrome, maybe like dizziness, um, all the way up to a large vessel occlusion that would present, you know, very in a dramatic fashion. Okay, well, let's stick with this very sick group of patients. Dr. Kronick, you mentioned that in your paper, there are recommendations for for treatment. Now, I remember, for example, back in the beginning of this uh, pandemic, we were, uh, some physicians anyway, were very enthusiastically uh, anticoagulating uh, patients in the hospital because of of this, uh, you mentioned, Dr. Liotta, there's a tendency uh, for uh, a hypercoagulable uh, state causing uh, stroke. So, so what do we do? Do we have uh, treatment algorithms now and prophylactic algorithms for encephalopathy and stroke? Early in the pandemic, uh, physicians were very frequently anticoagulating people because of uh, anecdotal experience with um, fre- frequent clotting. But there uh, has since been um, a number of clinical trials under the umbrella of the recovery trials that looked at the utility of anticoagulation in COVID patients. And it actually turns out that in the sickest patients, the critically ill patients, if you anticoagulate them without a specific indication, like uh, having a, a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, the bleeding risk is actually uh, uh, balances any benefit you get against thrombotic complications. But it looks like in patients who need to be hospitalized but have more mild disease, so they um, have elevated D-dimers, they don't require to be in the ICU, and maybe they're just on a little supplemental oxygen, it does look like anticoagulation benefits them um, up to 14 days. So we wouldn't want to just anticoagulate any, you know, every single COVID patient that's uh, in the hospital because it doesn't look like it actually benefits all of them. Similarly, you know, in the line of stroke, some some people thought about, well, what about if we just give everyone an aspirin? And it turns out that prophylactic uh, aspirin therapy was looked at as well, and that didn't really um, uh, result in a net benefit against stroke either. Dr. Yarder, that's great. Let, let me push a little further. You mentioned that for the mild patients in the hospital, anticoagulation could be a good thing, but for the sickest ones, it probably isn't. Is that right? Well, if uh, the sick ones have atrial fibrillation or they have DVTs, then you would anticoagulate them for yes, you know, those routine indications. Yes, unless there's a specific indication. But what happens when the mild ones become the sick ones? Well, when the mild ones become the sick ones, then the, they transition from where you uh, would have given them the anticoagulation in the trial to where they, you would discontinue it. Okay, so you would say, okay, well, you are no longer in in category A, you're in category B. So even though we started anticoagulation, for example, five days ago, it's better that we stop it now. Is that that correct? Hypothesis is that the anticoagulation is helping with microthrombosis rather than necessarily the macrothrombosis. And that maybe when you've progressed to a severe disease state that you already have such a, a burden of microthrombosis that that balance is no longer in your favor with anticoagulation. The, the clinical trials that looked at this weren't really designed to explore mechanism. So a lot of, you know, why are we observing, you know, uh, one treatment being successful in, a, in one group and not the other is, uh, you know, very based on hypothesis and um, maybe other disease models rather than you know, being directly investigated in that clinical trial. Well, clearly we still have a lot to learn about uh, the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19. Well, we're about halfway through our program. Why don't we switch to a discussion about long COVID? Uh, who would like to tell, tell us about that? Um, I can certainly speak to long COVID. Dr. Graham, thank you. So long COVID, or as the medical term is PASC, which is post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, is defined as at least one symptom of COVID-19 lasting for greater than four weeks. Some other institutions have varying definitions, but we like to use the four-week one, which um, was initially used by the CDC earlier in the pandemic. And 
the trouble with this definition, um, or sorry, the trouble with uh, really defining this population is that it is really a heterogeneous group, and there is not just one presenting symptom. So some symptoms in long COVID are more common than others, um, notably cognitive dysfunction is seen frequently, and so is fatigue, as well as headaches, dysautonomia, um, and then prolonged anosmia. But really, each patient that comes into our neuro COVID-19 clinic is just a little bit different. Um, so some people ask, what's their chance of getting long COVID after having a COVID infection? It's somewhere around 30%, and it varies in length depending on the patient. Um, fortunately, we know that with the new variants coming out, it, there is a little bit less of a chance of getting long COVID with our newer variants, um, but it's still definitely a real risk. Um, and we also know that one way to mitigate the chance of getting long COVID is um, to be fully vaccinated, including having a booster. So um, while this is a... Yes, thank you for that. I was going to ask you, does vaccination help prevent long COVID since you can uh, get uh, COVID even though you're vaccinated, although usually it's not severe? So the answer is yes, vaccination does help. Yes, and there is actually data about it. Um, some large studies coming from the UK showed that uh, vaccination decreased the risk of long COVID by 15%, but it's still a significant risk. Uh, a smaller study from Italy and healthcare worker showed that uh, three vaccination or two vaccination and one booster reduced the risk uh, of getting long COVID to 16%. That means you can still have long COVID and we see those patients coming to our clinic. We see also patients having a second or a third infection and developing long COVID despite vaccination booster uh, and uh, uh, coming to our clinic. And so far, there's, there's no other predictor uh, men, women, age, there, there's no indication. If I get COVID tomorrow, you could say, well, you're in a high-risk group of long COVID or, or a low-risk group. Do we have any data on that? We do. There was a study of over um, 200,000 patients who had COVID, and they found that the patients who had long COVID were actually more likely to be younger, um, be female, and to have had severe illness. So, um, the severe illness part makes sense, but um, the younger patients and the female sex doesn't make a whole lot of sense in some ways. So if I may add to it, when we uh, published our first initial paper with uh, E.D. Graham being the first author, uh, the first 100 patients seen in the clinic, we saw, uh, as E.D. said, that 70% uh, of the patients were female and 16% had history of autoimmune disease before COVID. And these were uh, patients who had a mild disease, never hospitalized for pneumonia or hypoxemia. So we think that there is an autoimmune predisposition of developing long COVID, since we know that women are more likely than men to develop rheumatoid arthritis, MS, lupus, and so on. And those patients had a higher rate of, of, of autoimmune disease prior to COVID. Okay, now, before we turn to treatment, I want to know... Is long COVID due to the damage done of the acute disease? We talked earlier about microthrombosis in the capillaries, for example, or is there an ongoing chronic infection? Yeah, so it may depend a little bit whether you're a hospitalized patient or a non-hospitalized patient. I think the people who are hospitalized and deal with severe illness they're not only experiencing COVID, but all of the complications of critical illness. So there are probably separate mechanisms of brain injury that an outpatient might not experience. Um, but we know that for the it's more complicated than just pulmonary disease or being hypoxic, because we see that there's patients who never really have significant pulmonary disease or never need to be in the hospital who develop um, uh, long COVID symptoms, uh, particularly cognitive symptoms. One of the other questions that um, comes up with the neurologic sequelae of COVID-19 is whether or not SARS-CoV-2 is a neurotropic virus, so whether or not it um, infects the brain itself. And um, this, to date, is 
a little bit more theoretical than proven that whether or not it, it could. Um, potentially, there is some more infection lower in the brainstem and the pons or medulla where there are ACE2 receptors in higher concentrations. Um, but otherwise, there, it's not known to be a virus that does infect the brain. So uh, to answer your question, whether there's a persistent infection going on in the body, this is something that we're trying to uh, answer in our lab. Um, since, the, as you know, the CDC is tracking pockets of infection in the U.S. by looking in sewage water for the uh, RNA of the virus, um, we think that the virus may be hiding in a hidden reservoir like the gut. Uh, and since if, if it can be found in the sewer, then uh, that's probably coming from the gut. And uh, we are starting to uh, test the stool sample from our patients for the presence of uh, SARS-CoV-2 either antigen or PCR. And we're finding that some patients indeed have ongoing infection. I would add um, along that line that we recently published a paper that demonstrated patients who had been hospitalized and continued to test positive for the viral uh, RNA by nasal swab actually had worse outcomes in terms of mortality and it had more complications in, in terms of encephalopathy in the hospital. And one of the hypotheses we proposed in that paper was that there could be either a latent reservoir in the body or another dysfunction of the immune system where it's not clearing the virus completely mm -hmm. um, in certain individuals. And to that extent, we think that the persistent infection may drive this dysregulation of the immune response that we are seeing in uh, the blood of our patients. And this dysregulation of the immune response may lead to autoimmunity, either mediated by autoantibodies or by autoreactive T cells. And it is an area of active investigation in my lab and in other centers. Now, for patients with long COVID, is there a treatment? So if we're going off the theory that there is potentially a persistent virus infection in the body, could you use something uh, like antivirals? So now we have a couple of antivirals out, like Paxlovid um, and Molnupiravir. Well, we only have currently a treatment regimen of five days, and that's only indicated for active infection. So, and we also know that patients who get Paxlovid may have rebound viral activation after stopping the course. So how would you know exactly how long to treat them for? Um, that would be a, a difficult question to answer. Um, but for the current treatments that we have, they do focus more on symptomatic control of um, whatever their current symptoms are. So if it's headache, we may give the patient um, nortriptyline, or um, sometimes I even give a short course of indomethacin, which has been shown um, to improve headache with, with just short courses of a couple weeks. Um, if it is something like blood pressure dysregulation or dysautonomia, then we may be looking at other treatments like um, staying well hydrated, compression stockings, graded exercise programs, um, or even medications um, that may support the blood pressure. So it really depends on what their symptom coming in, coming into the clinic is um, as to how we're going to address it. Well, to wrap up, Dr. Kralnick, uh, tell us uh, where uh, I can read uh, your paper and what's next in your research. So this paper was published in Neurotherapeutics Journal. It is online and you can, everybody can download it for free. Um, we have a lot of different ways of taking care of our patients, like uh, Dr. Graham said. For example, brain fog, which is the major uh, and most debilitating uh, manifestation that our patients complain of in the clinic is treated by first determining what is their cognitive dysfunction using uh, a tool that we use in the clinic called the NIH toolbox. Patients are then referred to our neurocognitive specialists to pinpoint exactly what is wrong with them, and then they are referred for cognitive rehabilitation at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab here in Chicago, and we've already sent you know close to 100 patients, and the preliminary result seems uh, uh, encouraging that uh, cognitive rehab is really helping them. Um, 
we are uh, doing other studies with other uh, members of our department, for example, uh, trying to figure out what is the component of sleep in uh, cognition uh, and uh, fatigue in those patients. Um, and we are uh, carrying out uh, actigraphy study to uh, understand if there's a dysregulation of the sleep-wake pattern in the, those patients that may lead to fatigue um, and the uh, problem with cognition. Uh, we're also doing those studies in the lab, trying to figure out if there are biomarkers of uh, cognitive dysfunction and the uh, brain inflammation uh, in our patients. And uh, this is an ongoing uh, you know, uh, effort. Uh, we are also um, looking at uh, this immune dysregulation uh, as a root cause of uh, long COVID in the same patient population. And uh, would it be possible, obviously, to treat those patients with antiviral medication if this was proven? Uh, basically, there is a, a multi-pronged effort going on in neurology and as well as in the comprehensive COVID center, which is a multi-disciplinary uh, 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 clinic, uh, which is a center that has 12 subspecialty clinics, including pulmonology, cardiology, gastroenterology, ENT, and so on, where uh, patients can uh, get uh, help for all their long COVID-related symptoms. Do you accept uh, referrals uh, from the community for uh, long COVID? We do. Um, there is a great need for more people to help with treating these patients because the wait times can be a couple months or more, but we absolutely accept new referrals. And uh, we have uh, full access to the clinic by not uh, requiring physician referral. We don't uh, need to have patients showing the proof of a uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive test, since we know that at the beginning of the pandemic, many people couldn't be tested or were not tested on time and therefore don't have a positive test, but they are seen in our clinic. We don't require also proof of insurance for people to come either in person or in televisit. Anybody who has access to a phone or a computer uh, all over the United States can see us, and we have seen so far more than 1,450 patients in the clinic since the beginning of the pandemic. Well, that's fantastic. You're providing such great uh, accessibility for uh, people with uh, COVID symptoms. Well, we've reached the end of our time, but before we close, is there anything uh, any of you would like to add? Well, I think we uh, the the pandemic has offered, I think, an opportunity to understand uh, a, acute illness even just beyond COVID. I think particularly what it highlighted for the uh, the hospitalist, the intensivist, is the magnitude uh, of disability that results from that encephalopathy that we talked about and has really highlighted for me that um, we need a lot more research in that area to really understand how to treat it and prevent long-term disability, um, and particularly cognitive disability. Our treatments, uh, as you uh, maybe uh, highlighted a little earlier in the podcast, are pretty limited. We don't even know if we should be giving these patients immunomodulatory therapy. We do know that things like excessive sedation actually worsens encephalopathy and cognitive outcome, and that things like um, actually f family visitation uh, can reduce encephalopathy and we think uh, improve outcome. So there's a, it's a very complex uh, syndrome that we're dealing with, and we uh, are really just scratching the surface of understanding it and discovering interventions. Dr. Iliata, thank you for that. Drs. Liata, Graham, and Koralnik, thanks for this very informative discussion and for joining me on Better Edge. Thank you very much again for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. To refer your patient or for more information, head on over to our website at breakthroughsforphysicians.nm.org neuro to get connected with one of our providers. And that wraps up this episode of Better Edge, a Northwestern Medicine podcast for physicians. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Thank you for listening.